Hey there, Dan Gastu here. In today's video, I'm gonna go through how to make a lower unit service stand. This is something I've been meaning to do forever. I, in the past, have always just put lower units in a vise like this by the skeg. It's not ideal because the skeg can break. I've been maybe lucky, maybe just careful, I don't know. I've never actually had one break. But it's about time I started to make a real one because one of the outboards I'm working on soon is much larger and I just want to make sure I can hold it a bit more securely. When using a vise to hold a lower unit like this to service it, there is one thing I do though, and that is always drop it as low down into the clamp as you can. And that does two things. One is it has the clamp around a thicker part of the skeg because it is tapered, so you're getting into the thicker metal. And the other thing is that reduces the leverage. If you have it at the tip, you've got lots of leverage on a thin bit of metal, really good chance it's gonna break. So if you are using a vise, make sure you drop it in as far as you can. But definitely the best option is to have some sort of custom stand. So I'll show you what I've got in mind. There are a few different designs for this type of stand, but what I believe is the simplest and the one I'm gonna to do today is a simple sort of U shape that the outboard gearbox drops down into. All I really need to figure out now is what are the dimensions of it. So if you imagine looking down onto the stand, what you've got is two longer sides and one shorter side, really simple. But the important thing is that this dimension here is wide enough for the biggest gearbox I'm gonna be working on to fit in but not so wide that smaller gearboxes are gonna fall through. So what I'll do is I'll take some measurements. I've actually got pretty much the smallest gearbox I work on here, and I've also got that large one I'm hoping to work on soon. So I'll measure both of those and we'll see where they sit. When you look down along this gearbox from the front of the boat towards the back of the boat, the measurements we need is we need the, the unit, the stand, to be wider than this part of the gearbox, but not wider than this sort of anti-ventilation plate because this ventilation plate here is the bit that's going to rest down onto the stand. To take these measurements, I'm just going to put a G-clamp around here and then measure off the clamp. It's not super precise because the, you know, the base of the clamp wobbles a little bit, but it'll get us in the ballpark. So this one's essentially 30 millimetres thick around the actual part of the gearbox, and then the ventilation plate is about... say 120 millimetres. So we'll call this 15 horsepower, 30 mil and 120. Next I'll jump up to the other end of the scale. This isn't actually a particularly huge outboard. I think it's only a 60 horsepower or something, but it just happens to have a particularly beefy gearbox. I've seen plenty of 90s or bigger with gearboxes actually smaller. So this isn't so much the highest horsepower motor I've got, but it is the physically biggest gearbox I've got. I'll take the same two sets of measurements on this and we'll see where we sit. What this tells me now is I need to make it at least 60 millimetres wide if this largest one's gonna slot in. And I have to have it under 120 so that the little one won't fall through. Now, if I made it about 100, I'm worried that the little one's only gonna have 10 millimetres on each side holding it in. So I wanna make it a bit smaller than that. And I do wanna leave a little bit of wiggle room in case I get a particular brand of outboard that's just a bit wider than others. So I'm thinking when I go is something around about 80 millimetres wide. I think that's gonna be a really nice sweet spot for small outboards and big outboards. I don't think the length here is super important. You want enough length that the gearbox is well supported, but not so much that they stick right out past the gearbox and really sort of getting in the way. So what I'll do is I'll just go and measure this, the length of this larger gearbox, and I'll pretty much make it exactly that. It'll be more than long enough for the small ones, but it'll really well support the larger ones. Well, I'm actually thinking even if it comes to about here, that's 500 millimetres. I think that's ample. So let's go 500 millimetres for the length. I'm gonna make this stand out of steel. I've seen plenty made from steel that's bolted. I've seen plenty that are made from timber and screwed together. If you make it out of timber, I would be inclined to make a full stand that goes around it, almost make that U twice, and then put some uprights, some like studs that come up and support the top at a good height. Steel has the advantage that it's strong enough to just be cantilevered it out and be self-supporting. So I'm gonna go with steel and I'm gonna weld it, but bear in mind the dimensions are kind of the important thing. You can definitely make it out of timber and you can definitely make it out of steel and bolt it together. I'm hoping to make it out of this piece of steel I got floating around the workshop. 
It's a 50 millimeter box section, probably only mm, hard to measure, but I'd say two, maybe three millimeters maximum in wall thickness. And I'm just, I'll just have a look now. It's 1300 long, so we need two 500s. Actually, we need a bit more than that. We need 550 for the sides because we want the 500 to here and then we need the 50 here. So we need 1100 for the long sections and then the back we want 80 plus another 100, we want 180. So we've just got enough, so that's nice. I didn't know that until then, so I'm pretty pleased about that. I will then be having a section coming off the side because I need to attach it to something. In some ways it can be nice to do that side here in a round tube because you can have that round tube go into another tube of a slightly larger diameter and then actually tilt the unit as well, which is a nice advantage to having a custom unit that's really made for this job. But I don't really want to put any money into this, so I'm just going to see what scraps I've got lying around. Good, I just found another piece of this. So that'll be my side section, which is good. So I'll put that aside. I have seen these units made quite regularly with angle line as well. So you have a bit of box section for that short section across the top, then the angle line comes across and down and then comes along. That I think is a nice design. You just need the flat surface at the top. So as long as it's strong enough, in that case I probably would weld it or at least find some other way of bracing it. But you can use just about anything that gives you that U section with a nice flat top. I'm now just going to go ahead and start marking this up. I've got one factory cut, one rough cut, so I'll just start from the other end and use the rough cut as the off cut at the end. I'll measure this piece of steel up now and I'll mark it up using a speed square like this to get the 45s. And before I'll cut it, I'll just show you how I've marked it. So here's the two 45 degree cuts I've marked. And at the very end, we've got another 90 degree cut and that's my off cut. These measurements here are 550 to this point, from this point to this point which gives me 500 from the end of this mitre to here. The narrow end of this wedge is the 80 that I was looking for here. And then the wide end is 180. So it's a 50 millimeter mitre, the 80 we need, another 50. Next thing I do is just put this down and put it onto an abrasive drop saw and go through these cuts. Now, because of the sort of the curve, the thickness of the blade, this isn't gonna be millimeter accurate, but we had quite a, an acceptable range in this, so I'm more than comfortable with that. If you're looking at making really accurate cuts, cut one piece, see how much metal the blade takes away, then measure the next piece, then measure the next piece after you cut them. Don't measure them all at once like this. But for the tolerances in this application, it's fine. Although this saw is marked in degrees, I'm just going to use this same speed square just to get it set up accurately. I'm now going to go take these pieces over to the wire wheel for a couple of reasons. One is so that I can take the burrs off so there's no sharp edges and they mate up against each other nicely. The other is so I can just take a bit of the galvanised coating off to make the welding easier. Here's what we've got now. Three pieces with all the 45s cut. What I'm going to do is measure our distance across here which turned out to be 180, that's good. And then I'll just set that same 180 up over here. So it's at 175 at the moment. So I'll just bring it out slightly, just sort of square everything up. So what I'll do is put a few tack welds on, re-measure this. If I wasn't being lazy, I could cut a bit of timber to put in here and then clamp it all together. That sort of locks it in place like a bit of a jig, but I think I'll just tack weld it, re-measure it, do a few more tacks, re-measure it, and then weld it out. I think it'll be fine. You may have noticed over the course of this channel that we've welded up quite a few things. And I've got to say, if, you, if you're not a welder, you know, and I'm certainly not a welder as such, but if you don't know how to weld at all, and you're looking for something to learn over the winter, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I highly recommend learning how to weld. It's one of those things that once you've got the hang of it, and it really isn't that hard, you'll start looking at problems in a totally different light. All the things suddenly you realise you can make, fix, whatever, it really does expand the sort of 
you know, your options when it comes to repairing and building things and fabricating things. So, something to think about anyway. Now, TIG welding doesn't have a, the splatter, say, that um, stick welding has, but it does give off a lot of UV radiation, so at least cover up with a long sleeve shirt. Got a couple of tack welds on there now. So I'll just check, we're still at 180. Still seems reasonably square. So I'll just put a couple of tacks on the back and if it's still square, I think we'll just start welding it out. Here we have it. Not super pretty, but it's all right. I'm gonna put some sort of poly board on here just to protect the paint of the outboard. But what I'll do first is weld a side bracket on that it'll be supported by, because if I weld that on afterwards, it's only gonna melt the poly board. So I'll quickly just put this sort of right angle piece coming out, and then I'll grab that piece of board and we'll start cutting that up. I'm now going to add a sort of a padding layer on top using this polyboard. This stuff I've used before for making the fishing rod holder and for padding out the transom when mounting outboards, that kind of stuff. It's been really useful and we've actually only bought one sheet and this is the last of it, but it's amazing how long it's lasted and how useful it's been. Anyway, so I'm going to cut just some strips to mount along here. We'll put those on and then we'll give it a test run. All right, so I've got these bits of polyboard cut to shape now. I'm gonna rivet these onto the metal frame, but I'm gonna counter-seat them slightly so the rivets don't scratch the paint and sort of defeat the whole purpose of putting this on. I think three rivets per side will be fine. So I'm just gonna hold it down and drill right through the poly and through the steel. They're bound to wobble a little bit, so I'm actually gonna do the rivet for this one first, just to hold it in place. Before I put this rivet in though, I'm just going to use a drill bit slightly bigger than the head of the rivet, just to countersink it. While I've got the larger drill bit in, I'm just going to do the countersinking. It doesn't really matter which order you do it in. Here are the rivets in now, and just countersunk slightly so they don't protrude above the polyboard and scratch the paint on the outboard. Here's the finished product. Nothing particularly special in some ways, but should be up to the job for quite a range of outboards. For now, I'm gonna use this by just putting the arm in a vise. Now that's done, before I go home, I've actually gotta do the water pump on this, so I may as well get straight into using it. To slot it in, you just come in from the back. You need to come in so that the, the bulb with the gearbox is down low and it'll slot in. Now, depending on what you're doing, you may wanna lock it in. I've seen a few different designs for this. Some involve just having some bolts and some metal that swings over. Other times I'm seeing people just put a G-clamp on it. To be honest with you, for now I think I'm just going to use the G-clamp. Just putting a bit of cloth under it just stops it once again from scratching the paint on the outboard. Because my vise is mounted here on the left hand side of the bench, if I want to do work on the bearing carrier, I can simply slot it in backwards, there's no real issue with this being in the way, but I'm thinking what I might even do is put some of this polyboard on the underside and I can simply flip it round and have it in the vise the other way and then slot outboards in this way as well. I don't think that extra board's going to get in the way at all, so I think that'll just make it a bit more versatile. Anyway, I'm going to get on and do this water pump now. Thanks for watching. I hope this video helps you if you're looking to make a stand like this. It was only a couple of hours work, it's not a lot, and you can definitely make it from timber, bolted, whatever you're most comfortable with. Really the important thing is having enough length to support the outboard and having it in that, to my mind, 80 millimeter range for the width, I think is almost perfect. That way you'll be able to take an outboard eight horsepower up to probably about a 90 or something. I'd be curious to see if there is an upper limit, because that section of the gearbox that slots here really only has the drive shaft, and although the drive shaft gets larger and the casing gets bigger just to handle the force, 
there's not much in there and outboard manufacturers are going to be trying to keep that thin to stop water resistance. So I'd be surprised if even with only an 80mm gap this can't take quite a large outboard. So I'll let you know if ever I sort of hit a limit with it as well. I'll put it in the description. So thanks for watching. Please rate, comment and subscribe. Last weekend I went on a bit of an offshore fishing trip, it was a lot of fun, and I posted some photos on Instagram, so if you're interested in following along with some of the boating related things that happened between the videos, uh, just subscribe to Dengas Stewart Instagram. Alright, take care, see you next time, bye.